of the homework problems. How many people are doing chapter two's problems? Two people? Two out of 13? I recommend moving into those ASAP. We're going to be done with chapter two um, pretty soon. So you want to be getting into, into chapter two problems for sure. How are the proposals coming along? Anybody got a draft? Nobody's working on it. One draft. Outline. It's up there. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I'll have office hours this week. Come by and talk to me if you haven't. Um, I haven't talked to one person yet that uh, could, could use a little direction on that. Okay. No homework question problems? Yeah? Okay. <clears throat> Let's revisit where we ended last time. Um, so, the last thing that we talked about, we, um, we made headway on the two-point theorems last time, right? And so, can somebody tell me what... What are the criteria to be able to use the velocity and acceleration two-point theorems? Chris? Two points have to lie in the same plane. Is that sufficient? Same rigid body is a, is a better way to state that. And those two points, what's special about those two points in that rigid body? What's, what's special about their relationship? There's one more criteria that would allow you to use that. You can have two points in a rigid body. If you know the velocity of one and you're interested in the velocity of the other, there's got to be one more factor that's true for you to be able to apply that theorem. Anybody remember? It has to do with the relation of the two points. Chris? Not, uh, a point doesn't have an angular velocity. A frame does. Correct. You're ma, right? Na, sorry. I was looking, I guess you're, they might, they're flipped in the, uh, your surname is listed as, it seemed like it was listed as na in the thing, but maybe I'm wrong, in the, in Canvas. I remember looking at it. Um, that's correct. So um, these two points, when you look at them in that rigid body, from, with respect to that rigid body, they can't move relative to each other. They have to be fixed relative to each other. So that's the key, key, key aspect. And then if you know the angular velocity of that rigid body and the velocity of one point, you can find the velocity of the other point using the two-point theorem and the acceleration of the other point using the two-point theorem. So right at the end of last class, we um, alluded to um, another theorem that we're going to investigate, which is, has to do with a point, two points in a rigid body, except one of them is moving. Right? So we know how no longer have that fixed, the two points fixed together criteria. Um, there's also a way to deal with the, these two points if they happen to be moving with respect to each other in that rigid body. So as a reminder here, I'm not going to write in orange. Um, so one point, P, So we have one point moving in B, while B is moving, um, the, refer the rigid body B is moving in the reference frame A. Um, let 
bar, I mean b bar, be a point fixed in b that coincides with a point p at a particular instance. And recall, um, sketch for this is uh, if I have some reference frame A here and some rigid body potato B here, and it has some reference frame that there is a point P that could be moving along some arbitrary path in B when looked at from B. And uh, we're going to call this point P bar that when I take a snapshot in time, P bar and P coincide. Then you can write the velocity of P in A, which we're, is what we're interested in, equals the velocity of P in B plus the velocity of B bar in A. Right? Now, this idea that it coincides with point P at a particular time implies that the velocity of B bar and B is always zero. All right, so that's a key factor there. There's a corollary, too. Uh, you can also think about the acceleration of P, and the acceleration of P ends up being this. The acceleration of P and A plus, sorry, it's P and B. P and B plus the acceleration of B bar in A, which is similar to what we have above, but there's an extra term. Does anybody know what that extra term? We talked about it last time. We sort of saw it as a result of another calculation of our uh, points P1 and P2 moving on that plane. What was that interesting acceleration term called? Coriolis. So if you have a point moving in a, in a reference frame, you get this term, this interesting um, acceleration term that pops out. It looks like this. And that is the Coriolis acceleration term. And it's a, it's, a, it's a result of taking the time derivative of that above equation. You know, this is what you end up with. If you properly do all of your derivatives with respect to the frames that they are um, called in, so this here is is this second theorem. So these have to do. Um, they're called the going to be referred to as well. We refer to them as the one point theorem. Uh, what else did I want to say about that? That the Maybe just to name these also. Right, this is the relative velocity acceleration of P and B. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Relative acceleration. And then this term. My, my line got rid of my B bar. Let's make that a little more clear. This is B bar. Right, that is um, going to have some parts to it, too, much like our two-point theorem predicts. And it's going to contain omega crossed omega 
across to R, right, the centripetal acceleration. It's also going to contain an alpha B The eraser's not not beautiful on this. It's also going to have this tangential acceleration of B bar in A. And, um, and then whatever the acceleration of B bar and B is. All right, so that's made up of all the, we get the tangential acceleration, the um, centripetal, then you have the Coriol this Coriolis term, and, uh, and the relative acceleration. And all, and all that ends up being this you know, pretty monster of a formula here with a lot of things to, to calculate there. Any questions on that? Does that make sense about this B bar coinciding with P at, at a particular instance? So I wanted to sort of jump to an example, but I'm going to do it with uh, SymPy. So if you want to open up bicycle.uc Davis. Killed my display somehow. Try it again. Okay. Okay, so I've got this and um, Call this image we've been working with. We already we have already calculated. Doesn't want to get any smaller. We've already calculated. Um, go ahead and create a new notebook here. We've already calculated the velocities and accelerations of point P1 and P2 in this figure, and we use the two-point theorem, right? And what frame was the frame that both points are fixed in? for us to be able to use that. E. So E is this reference frame that we've defined here. And P1 and P2 don't move with respect to each other in E. So once we found out the velocity of P1, we apply the two-point theorem for velocity and acceleration to easily get P2. right? But if you step back to B, B frame, you can also consider that, well, P1 is just some point moving in B, right, as well as P2. And um, the theorem that I just showed you, we may, we may be able to use to get the same result. Let me uh, get a little space here. So standard imports. Get tired of me typing that. Turn on the printing. 
Okay, and then we have some variables, Q1, Q2, Q3. All these vary with time. So once again, I use dynamic symbols. And then we have um, omega. I'll use W, um, L, and then we just have T that we're going to need to. And that'll be, I'll call it omega and um, L, T. All right, so we've got some symbols to work with. We've got three reference frames. First we have A. That's the um, sort of fixed reference frame. And, and I'll, I'll show you a new way to orient a new frame that saves a little bit of typing. Uh, the next frame, frame is B. So I can type a, um, B equals A dot orient. But instead of using the orient like we've been, you can also do orient new. And orient new just sort of combines the two lines. I can just type. That's what I want the name of my new reference frame to be. And then after that, it's the same arguments. Axis, rotate through. Um, omega times t is the angle, and then the vector it rotates about is going to be a dot y. So that'll create b. Try to create uh, e using that same method there on your own. You want to do it? The password is the same as the uh, username. I got a laptop last week. A lemon? Oh, geez. That sucks. And disappointing. It's like Christmas and you Christmas falling apart and collapsing. It's like when the guy shot the BB and broke his glasses. <laughs> values, omega t, q3 is this angle you're going to be needing right now. So what's E re rotate relative to? B. So if I use the orient dot orient new, will be the first argument there. There's the help file too. E, right? I just name the new reference frame I'm creating. And then what? Axis, 
and then what's the angle about B Z. All right, so that, that'll create um, this new orientation. Now, a key thing, one thing that happens, can happen automatically for us, is now um, I can say, I want to know B dot angular velocity in A, and it calculates that automatically, although that looks wrong. Oh, anybody know, see what I did wrong? <laughs> Why would I get, I got T dot, omega, omega t times T dot plus T times omega dot. What does that imply? Yeah, I made, I made these things a dynamic symbol. This is supposed to be symbols, right? Because they, if I take a derivative with respect to time, I wouldn't get anything there. I'm going to quiet that. All right. Now, does that look right? So I can do that, and then I can say e dot angle velocity in uh, b, right? That looks right. And then I can also just, it'll automatically give me the accelerations that we need. Does that make sense? Should I get zero when I will look for the angular acceleration of B and A? Yeah? Yeah, because we have a constant angular, angular rotation there. So I go through and I get those eight angular accelerations that I might need as we move forward. Now, the first thing, um, I think we want to tell it that O does not have any velocity in A. So I'm going to say, let's create some points. O equals me dot point O. And then um, I'm just going to go ahead and say that O, the velocity, sorry, set velocity of O in reference frame A is zero. Okay, so that's going to be this point fixed in A, and we're going to get the accelerations and in in velocities with respect to O after that. Right, so we set that velocity to O, and we're basically done with O, except using it as a reference. And now let's create P1. Um, just like uh, you, um, the orient new me method, I can also do something called there's a locate new method, and it works very similarly. I can say this is P1, and then I can just tell it, well, what's the vector from O to P1? What would be the vector from O to P1? Correct. Right. So I, um, and these are two time varying variables. Right. So I get my my position vector there. And then if I call right after it, p1 dot position from o, it'll return that variable for me. Right. And then p2 equals p1 dot locate new. Go ahead and type type what's supposed to happen there to locate P2 relative to P1. This is EX, EY, EZ, 
think I'm seeing the correct answer. What do I type here? What would be the first argument? P2, we're creating it's just the name of the new point we're creating, and then what, what vector? You guys got to speak louder. Can't hear. L times E dot X, right? And then I can do, I'll just do P2 position from O here all the way back to the origin. See if that looks right. Yeah? And then you can you know, express it in whatever frame you might want. Now that you have that vector, let's express it in the B frame. And that all looks fine. It's basically we 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 did that last time. Okay, so now to apply the a, the uh, the one point theorem for velocity, uh, we have this. We have a position to here and a position to here, and this is some point moving in B, right? <clears throat> and if we if we think of an instantaneous point. Uh, I'll call it B, B bar here, right? just like we've had before, that I can find the velocity of B bar in A and then add uh, the velocity of P1 in B, right? So we could, we could do that manually. Um, if I want to get the um, velocity of B bar in A, then... Actually, B bar is fixed. Okay, I don't know if I can do that explicitly. Let's just let's just have a look at the. Let's start with P one, and if I hit Tab, V, there's a V one point and a V point V two V one point theory and V two point theory. We already talked about V point two V two point theory, so let's look at point one. So we have our, it takes another point, the frame out frame, which is the frame that you want the velocity to find in, and then the frame that's shared. And if you know the velocity, in this case, if I want the velocity of P and N, and I know the velocity of P and B, the shared frame, plus here the velocity of O and N, that's going to be zero in our case, right? Plus this extra term that, um, recall that you can write, write that as an omega crossed R because it's within that frame. And the, and the fixed point that we're working with um, would just end up being that. So to use that, I think we have enough there. I can say... Give me this with respect to O. I want the velocity in the A frame, and the point is moving in the B frame. Is the notation there? So if I call that, I get an error because I forgot to do something. The velocity of point P1 has not been defined in reference frame B. That's what I'm missing. So I'm going to create a new cell here. So if I do P1 velocity in B, I don't have that defined. So that's what, what we need to set. So we're going to set the velocity of P1 in B to some vector. What would be the velocity of P1 in B? Yeah, so I can use diff, and we'll put t in there explicitly, times b dot x plus q2 diff with respect to t times b dot y. And then if I call p1 dot velocity in b, what did I do wrong there? <laughs> 
Oh yeah, this is supposed to be a times. There we go. All right, so it's if I if I'm standing in B, P one's just moving Q one dot and uh, Q two dot in those two two directions. So now I've set that velocity that we need. Yes, Chris. So do you know like you need to find the orientation of P one and the position and the Yes, so we could also, you know, we know that all I have to do is P1 dot position from O dot DT in B should give me the same thing. All right, so we could have just typed that in there too. All right, so I just typed it explicitly, but we've already defined that position. If I take the time derivative in B, I get, I get the answer that was deduced otherwise. <clears throat> so either either one of those are fine and you and you should probably use line 31 because you know you already took the time to set the uh, position vector of that. Now when I call v1 point theory I, I get my velocity. Okay so it has um, right the velocity of this point in B and then there's this extra term, which is the velocity of that point in A. And it's omega times Q1 dot in the negative BZ direction. Right? So it's rotating that way, you get this velocity term. And that's what we got, got yesterday, or last time. Um, immediately after that, I can say P2, P1 dot A1 theory with the same arguments and all the information should be there to calculate my acceleration of P1 using the A1 A point theory. Right? And that should look familiar from last time too. You have the uh, Chris Yeah, so this is what you would have to type. So line, I'm going to add a cell right here. Copy this. Paste that. And then I would replace this with P1 dot position from O dot D, T, and B. And then P1 dot velocity and B. So, so now lines... I'm just going to restart and run now so, our, so the line numbers are in order there. So if I commented out this, for example, and then run all. That works. So I'm not sure you might need to do the same thing I did, make sure that I haven't screwed up something and I just ran them all in order again. But uh, those two things are equivalent. You know, we defined the position so we could just take the derivative B to get that value or Scott recognized it offhand and, and I just typed it explicitly. So that should be sufficient then. You need the velocity of this point in the frame the frame that both points are in, and then the angular velocity, and then you can use the one-point theorem. Okay, so now P2, with that same thing in mind, why don't we just take a few minutes and you try to get P2 using the one-point theory. So get the velocity and acceleration of P2 using the one point theory for both of these but you're going to have to just like we had to set make sure we know what 
the velocity of P1 is in B, you're going to need to know what the velocity of what in B is. Any idea? Just let you hack at it. Take a few minutes, see if you can get the velocity and acceleration of 0.2 using that same theory, considering that 0.2 is a point moving in reference frame B.
same thing you got the other day? Last class? No? Expressing it in B and then simplifying it to make it a, the same thing that we had last time. If you recall how to do that. Not sure that that statement is quite what you want. Think about that one. Looks like most people got it. Anybody still not got that? Got an answer there? So what um, what do we need to do first? Set the, set the velocity of P2. Um, in what frame? B frame, right? So P2 is a point moving with respect to O in the B frame. So if we know its velocity in the B frame, then we can add that to whatever the velocity of the point instantaneously at P2 is and, and get our whole, whole velocity expression. So if I um, take P2, set velocity in the B frame, what, is this, what, what should this be? How could I get a hold of that velocity of P2 in the B frame? I saw some correct answers. Don't be shy. How do we get the velocity of P2 in the B frame? I'm going to call on somebody. How about you? Your name again is? Ting Jin? What do you think? How do you get that? P2 from P1. So that gives me the position vector. Anything else? How many people use that? Two? How many people think it needs to be adjusted? Nobody? Position from O. If you take position from P2, we only know, we're only getting the velocity relative to this point. But this is the point that's fixed in B, and this thing's just moving around in B. So we want to go all the way back to O. So then, O. And then if I, you know, just display it, P2 velocity in B, we get that, all right? Which we may have... And we hadn't set that already. So that, does that look right? Now, I think there's, we have the velocity of P2 and B, and um, we know the angular velocity of B and A. And there's a position vector that goes from O to P2 to give us that instantaneous point. So I think that if I say P2 dot v1 point theory uh, with respect to O, 
we want the velocity in the A frame and both points are in the B frame, I think we get that. And then I'm going to add an express in B here. So that should be what you got yesterday. That was P2. We didn't even, we forgot about P1. Did we do that? Oh, we did P1. And then finally, we um, should be able to type the same thing, A1 point theory, O, A, B, dot express, and B. And I'm, that's getting a little nasty, so I'll use simplify to help, help tame that. And this, if you go back and check what we computed Wednesday, should match. Right? Okay? So what are the, ta the takeaways from this here? How, when can you use the one-point theorem, and, and how is it useful? Why would I want to use this one point theorem? We solve the same thing with the two point theorem. So there's the two point theorem, we are only able to use the two point theorem because this didn't change with time, basically. If that was Q4 and changed with time, the two-point theorem starts, will break down. But the one-point theorem would work here. right? So we have a point with a known velocity, which is zero here. Some point moving in, that, in the plane any, you know, in any fashion that it possibly can. It can be defined, this motion can be defined in any way. We can use the one-point theorem to get a hold of its velocity. Yeah? Any questions on that? There? Okay, let's... Um, we'll go ahead and take a five-minute break since it's a good stopping point. And remember, during the break, if you go to tinyurl.com, 222 feedback, you can tell me anonymously what you did or did not understand, you know, since the last time I got some feedback, and I can try to address that. So take five minutes, come back at uh, out is a, is a very important bit and, and also a bit more tricky, I think. Um, but we're going to talk about constraints. So the motion doesn't always, um, is, is often constrained to, um, move in a certain way. And we have to be able to deal with those constraints. So just to start, let's introduce some new words and, and things so that we can sort of talk in the same language. So the first thing is state variables. And you may have heard this in other uh, classes. But we're going to say that uh, the state variables of a set S of V particles, PI, which would have I equals 1 to V there, in a reference frame A, consists of two parts. The first is the configuration, right? There's some state of configuration of S in A, right? And that defines where the particles are 
So this is strictly have to do with position. And then B, also, there may be some uh, definition of the motion of S and A, which has to do with how they are moving in A. Right. If we know the position of a set of particles and then how they're moving, we're, we're said to know the state of that, those set of particles in A. And a fundamental question that we are interested in in this, in, in this class, and, uh, and also in dynamics in general, is how does the state change as time changes? Okay, and that's primarily what we're going to be after um, for any system, in any system that we're investigating. So, a little more here. The configuration is um, characterized by the position vectors. of each particle and the motion is uh, characterized by the velocity vectors. And so, um, to know the full state of an unconstrained system, we need either two V vectors or that equates to um, six V measure numbers. Right, so each vector has three measure numbers. And this was for what I called as unconstrained motion. Well, a key thing about constrained motion is that any constraints reduce these number of variables. All right. And um, introduce a little more, a few more terms here. Um, configuration variables. are called, we're going to call them the generalized coordinates of S in A. Okay, so generalized coordinates of S in A. And the motion variables, sort of similarly, are going to be called um, generalized speeds of SNA. Okay, so there are two, two new terminologies there, generalized coordinates and generalized speeds. And both of these make up the state variables and define the configuration and the motion of, this, of any set of particles or a system um, in a reference frame A. Now, both of these are functions of time. And I'll use uh, 
and these abbreviations often. Both the generalized coordinates and generalized speeds are functions of time. And both can be chosen in an infinite number of ways. Okay. So you can use any definition of the particular generalized coordinates and speeds that you want to describe your system. And that is a um, advantage and a disadvantage for the dynamicist. Does anybody not have that? Just a bunch of text. So let's look at a little example to think about you know, what this may mean. I'll sketch this out. So I've got a basic bowl. has the radius R, big R there, and <clears throat> we're interested in a particle, use a different color, particle P that lies on that surface of that bowl, right? And this particle P may have a position defined in these Cartesian coordinates of that red set of uh, axes. So a constraint, what would a constraint be for that particle P to ensure that P is always on that surface of that hemispherical bowl, given the coordinates of it, x, y, and z? Chris? So if I if this is this vector p bar, you're saying take the magnitude of p bar and do what? Has to be less than r or exactly r. Has to be r, right? And p bar is x squared plus y squared plus z squared, right? And then I'm going to write this. like that, okay, a constraint equation. This has to be equal to zero for P to be on the bowl. All right, so this is a configuration constraint. Right, so in any instance in time that has to hold and it's going to define that the position will be on the bowl somewhere. The other aspect of this is that right now the GCs that I chose are X, Y, and Z, right? But I mentioned that you can choose an infinite number of generalized coordinates to describe the location of that. What would be an alternative set of coordinates that describe the location of P here? <coughs> 
You can introduce any any variables you want. Chris? If we put the coordinate system at P, you mean like the if I said that, that this had an origin and I moved the origin there? So that's sort of like thinking of a maybe a body fixed set of coordinates or something. Yeah, that, I think that would lead you in the right direction there. If it, if we did have a body fixed set of coordinates, um, that uh, look like. Are you saying to put them par this coordinate system would be parallel to the one we have or not? So that sounds maybe, is that a cylindrical coordinate system? Then? Xz. So if I put a plane through this thing, like that or something, and then you detect the angle between this plane, is that what I'm hearing? Maybe. Well, that that's I think that's a way to go. Um, I could if I could make a plane that um, uh, that holds the vector p bar and the vector we'll call this uh, z hat. And z hat. So if I have a plane that is always a line, that uh, those two vectors are always always in, then I could think about some angle, maybe theta there, and then I could also think about an angle here. The drawings are not looking that swift. Oops. So if I add this plane back and I put a dotted line through here, so that's in the plane, and I call this theta, right? And then I'm use another color so this stands out. If I call that angle, phi or something, and then I know that the length of That vector is R. That is another set of coordinates, right? I could say then um, theta, phi, theta and phi, right? Those are the only two coordinates that are changing with time. So that's <coughs> what is that sufficient? If I know theta and phi, do I know exactly where phi is? So those two are also generalized coordinates options that could locate p at any any time tells you the configuration and I don't need a configuration constraint right if I just know phi and phi and uh, theta then those are the only two time varying variables there that I need to know to get the configuration. Chris? Is it possible for, like, in terms of like, the body of the core control, just to have a Yeah. Are there certain situations where you would go through a system or over constraint over constraint? Yeah, you could certainly over constrain the system. If we added, if we had if we had phi, theta, and z, that could be that sort of over constraining it, right? Because you know I can't have uh, if I set phi and theta, it, z is a function of those two. But if I tried to specify z also along with those, then I'm going to I'm going to have problems. So that's an that would be over constrained. You had a question? <coughs> 
Yeah. If we can say that it can't jump off the top of the bowl, then there's another configuration constraint there. That would be like if uh, if phi right is is negative, then um, psi. I'm not saying the wrong thing. If psi is negative, less than zero, that could also be a config config constraint. I wasn't didn't mean to go that far with it, but I guess I should have used a sphere instead of a hemispherical bowl. But yeah, that would be could be an additional configuration that. Uh, if phi is less than zero, that um, phi has to be zero, basically. Okay. That's what I wanted to get at there, I guess, was that these are two. This is a set of three generalized coordinates and a configuration constraint that ensures we know where the point is. And then here's two generalized coordinates that tell us where the point is, right, without a configuration constraint. So... To say a few more things here, um, in general, has everybody got that? A configuration constraint um, are a set of equations. can be written as follows. And these, notice that every variable in there, except for the time variable, is a coordinate, right? A generalized coordinate, potentially. So there's no velocity terms in here. Um, right, no velocity terms. It could also include constants, like in our case, the r value from that last example. But these are the sort of time-dependent de time things that are associated in that equation. And this is called um, a holonomic constraint equation. All right? And that means that it's functions of positions in time. And there's one more distinction. Um, I've never found these uh, two words that useful, but uh, you can also say there's two types. Uh, one is something called reonomic, and that is um, when time is explicit, and another term, scleronomic. when time is implicit. Right, so in that above equation, <clears throat> for all the generalized coordinates, they're implicit in time, you know, and then if you have an explicit value of t in the equation somewhere, that, that uh, defines these two distinctions. And this function here is a... Um, You can have a single constraint, or we can have many associated with any, any given system. 
So it also can sort of take on a, a vector, vector form of that equation. Another key thing is that um, not only is f equal to 0, but also df dt must be equal to 0. All right. So this constraint is something that's fixed in time. Um, with respect to time, it's not going to vary how the things are constrained as, to, as, uh, as a function of time. So both of those have to be true. If we think about the constraint equation that we had for the example, you could write df dt, right? So if f equals x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus r, and that all equals to zero, then df dt equals x times x dot plus y times y dot plus z times z dot equal to zero. So that would have to hold. <clears throat> this equation is sort of another is another way to express that configuration constraint. And you could have written the configuration constraint in this fashion from the get-go, right? If you if you knew that that is, that would hold true too. Um, it's important to note that um, new version of the configuration constraint. But it includes velocities. Right? And I said above that a configuration can, can, constraint can not have velocities. Right? But this has the, time, the velocities of some of those configuration variables, some of those generalized coordinates. Um, it's not really a new configuration constraint, though. And, and the reason it isn't is that... Um, you can always you can integrate this function to get this function okay and an important distinction is if if you have some equation of the generalized coordinates and their velocities is that if it's integrable such that you can recover some function that's only a function of the configuration variables, then this is just an, a redundant way of stating a configuration constraint. So, um, if integrable, of stating f equals 0. And it is fundamentally a holonomic constraint. Any, any questions on that? And we're going to show you how to check. I'll show you in a minute how to, with an example, how to check whether um, that's integrable. I mean, I guess I could show you here. Um, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do this twice then. So, <clears throat> We can assume that if I have df dt, that I should be able to write the partial of f with respect to the first generalized coordinate times the time derivative of that generalized coordinate plus the partial of f with respect to y 
dy dt plus the partial of f with respect to z d z dt and the partial of f with respect to t if it's explicit in t. Ours, ours is not explicit in t. So we, we just use this equation to calculate this from that, right? But if I were to integrate this equation, can I, can I go backwards? And if I can, that means it's integrable. Um, one easy way to check whether this is integral, integrable or not is to investigate these partial derivatives. It turns out that uh, for a function to be integrable, and you may remember this from your calculus class, that the mixed partial derivatives must be commutative, commutative. And so that what that means is, is that to be integrable, the partial of f with respect to x, sorry, the second derivative of f with respect to x and then y must equal the partial of f squared The, the partial with respect to y and then the, uh, the partial with respect to x. So this must be true for all combinations there. So um, this means mixed partials must commute. Right? And if I take the partial, so that's that, that's that, and that's that, All right? If I calculate the partial of f with respect to, if I know the partial of f with respect to x equals x, then the partial of f squared is going to be 1. If I take the derivative with respect to y, and then the partial of f with respect to y equals y, and then if I take the partial f squared of that's also going to equal 1, right? And so those mixed partials are equal. So it means that this function is integrable. And I can check all combinations of those partials. And all of them have to be equal for it to be integral. If any of them aren't e equal, then um, it is not integrable. We will not be able to integrate this arbitrary equation that has configuration co uh, generalized coordinates and the velocities. All right, that might have been a mouthful. I don't know if I did a great job explaining that, but uh, any questions there? If you have some constraint equation that includes velocities of the generalized coordinates, any generalized speeds, if you can integrate it to get back this thing that doesn't have any speeds in it, then that means it's a fundamental holonomic constraint. Right? And, the, and one way to check, a an easy way to check instead of trying to do the integral yourself, is um, realizing that this should be in this form. And it turns out from a, a theorem in calculus that if these mixed partials do not commute, then any of them do not commute, then it's non-integrable. And if it's non-integrable, we've got a different kind of constraint equation to deal with. It is not a holonomic strain equation. Okay, any questions? Probably have, we'll have to think about that outside of class too.
I remember not knowing what the hell the professor was saying when I saw that first time. Okay, so the next bit, anybody not have this sheet? All right, let's continue on with this. Um, another important thing is that, uh, and we sort of saw this with that little example of the hemispherical bowl, is that in intelligent, I'll put that in quote, choices of generalized coordinates and generalized speeds, right? This is something that the modeler, the dynamicist, gets to choose. They're a part of um, the art of dynamics. So being able to identify, like in that hemispherical bowl, knowing that I should probably choose phi and, um, phi and theta versus x, y, and z uh, is, is something, it's an art that you, you develop. And it's, um, it's not always obvious. Um, you can methodolic, um, you know, try to just try bunches of different combinations to try to get to the best one, but it's usually best to um, gain experience in um, different types of systems that have already been solved, and then use that information to help you choose uh, good choices of generalized coordinates and speeds. So, how do we choose these? How do we choose them intelligently? First, it's important to note that every system has a minimum, and I'm going to use the variable n, of generalized coordinates that are required to specify the configuration. There is a minimum set for every given set of particles or system that is a minimum number. And finding that minimum number is very useful because you can avoid having extraneous configuration constraints. Right? If you discover this minimum number, you can eliminate having extra unnecessary configuration constraints. Um, all n coordinates must be independent of each other to be that minimal set. Right, and this implies that there are no holonomic constraints if n is minimal. Right, so a constraint equation is relates two configuration variables, just like I said, uh, if we added, if we had phi and theta and we added z, z could be considered a generalized coordinate as a function of those two other variables. And, uh, and that is, that would make it a non-minimal set, right? Only phi and theta from the last example would be a minimal set. All right, so that's, that's the case here. And um, we can use the holonomic constraints to get to this minimal set of coordinates that are necessary. <laughs>
Uh, next bit is um, if there's a holonomic constraint, there's also a non-holonomic constraint. So all other constraints, besides what we've just talked about, um, are called non-holonomic constraints. Oops. My eraser doesn't want to work. Non-holonomic constraints. And actually, I think it's proper not to, you don't need to dash. Non-holonomic constraints. And these involve velocities, is the key thing. So these are these non-integrable constraint equations. So non-holonomic constraints... must involve, sorry, my handwriting's getting worse as we go, must involve velocities, generalized speeds, um, but are but are not able to be integrated To remove the velocity dependence. Non holonomic con constraints are essential velocity constraints. Right? They're always going to have velocities. So if you have velocities in a constraint equation and you can't, and it's non-integrable, it is a non-holonomic constraint. So what does that sort of mean in a more practical sense? Um, <clears throat> Here's a little example. Um, call it an ice skate Okay, if you think about just a simple plane, planar motion here, and I have some ice skate on that plane, and it has a point P stuck to it. Then we could define the location of P with some coordinates X and Y. And let's say, too, that the uh, angle of that skate is theta. So if I know P, location of P in theta, I have the configuration of that skate in time, right? But here I say the ice skate blade that can slide only along its length. That means that, that implies that the velocity of this skate, the velocity of P, and we'll call this um, A, the velocity of P and A must always be along the skate. Right? So it can only slide along its length there. So we're going to constrain the direction of that velocity vector of the point P to always be along that thing. And here we have three generalized coordinates. 
x, y, and theta. And then x dot, y dot are measure numbers of V of P and A, which would look like, well, just leave it at that. Right, two measure numbers. That gives us the velocity of P. But we have this constraint, and that is that the direction of that velocity vector has to follow this rule, that the tangent of theta is going to be the ratio of the x velocity measure number, the x measure number versus the y measure number. So this thing here is, is a constraint on the system. That, that forces that velocity vector to always be in a certain direction, right? And it turns out that this is non-integrable, right? I can write this as a function of x, y, theta, and then maybe t, and that would look like tan theta minus, I'm sorry, y theta. I did this wrong, too. You guys got to catch me. It's supposed to be y dot over x dot, right? It's tangent of theta is always y over x. So I can rewrite that and express it as x dot tan theta minus y dot equals 0. So I can write it in, in this uh, functional form like we were looking at before. And we want to ask ourselves now um, about this. Is it integrable? All right, can I integrate this equation such that I have a, a new function that does not have any speeds in it, y dot or x dot. So I showed you how to integrate, how to check that with these mixed partials on the last one. Oops. Right, we know that df dt takes this form, and we've got something that has these x dots in it. And then can you check these mixed partials and see if they're the same? So we only got seven minutes, eight minutes left. And why don't we take, take five minutes and see if you can tell me if that's integrable or not using the same method that I did before. Right, so you write this in terms of, uh, we've got this form of the equation. You should be able to identify what those partial derivatives are. And then if you take the second partial with respect to one of the other variables, you can compute, compute these mixed partials and, and then see if, they are, if they commute. 
worth maybe doing them, just to remind yourself that that's the case. All right, so what's the partial of f with respect to x? Can you hear you? The partial of f, if this is f here, if I take it with respect to x, hold on, am I doing something wrong? Right, this is that in this equation. So this must be that, right? So I'm just matching terms here. The partial of f with respect to s must be equal to tan theta in this case. Partial of f with respect to y is what? I match terms. Negative 1. And a partial of f with respect to theta, zero. So if I just match terms from my from this this constraint equation to this explicit form of the derivative, I can determine these. And then if I um, if I then take the second derivative, for example, the partial of with y and then the partial with x and then you ask does that commute take them in that order if you do that for these we both get 0 equals 0 right good to go that commutes but then if I do the partial check another one for example we'll do the partial of I didn't write that right. 
I mean, x and theta. Does that equal the partial of f with of theta x? The one on the right, if I take the partial of f with respect to x, I get 0. And then I take the partial of that with respect to 0, I get 0. But if I take the partial of f with respect to theta, I get secant squared theta. And then take that with respect to x. I'm going to get secant squared theta there. So that one, that one doesn't commute, right? So if I take the partial with respect to f with respect to theta, and I'm not believing myself right there. Did I do something wrong? Well, time's over. I'm fried. <laughs> Go ahead. We'll double check this. But this partial, this partial, um, or this mixed partial doesn't commute. If I take the partial with respect to um, x first, and then take it with respect to theta, I get secant squared. I had those sort of swapped, I think. Right. Partial with respect to x is tan theta. Then I take it with respect to theta, I get secant squared. And then the other one, I get 0. Right? So what this means is it's non-integrable, and this is a holonomic constraint, non-holonomic constraint. Right? All right, we're done. We'll uh, check back in on that.